Hey, what's going on with shipping? Sal Mercagliano here with our week of live interviews with people I think you're going to find really fascinating. Uh, this week, we start off with Jay Mintzmeyer. We're going to have on Bruce Jones from over at uh, the Brookings Institute. And then we're going to throw on at the very end here with John Conrad uh, talking about news and what's going on with shipping. So there is a lot going on, I'm not going to lie, when it comes to shipping. And I couldn't think of anybody better to have on board to start us off this week than Jay Mintzmeyer. Uh, Jay Mintzmeyer has been a supporter of this channel for a long time. And I've had a chance to know Jay for a while. So it's a pleasure. I'm going to bring him on right now with us. There he is. First off, Dr. Mintzmeyer, it's such a pleasure to have you on. We can just keep calling each other doctor the entire time and be absolutely annoying to everybody. Yeah, absolutely, Sal. It's great to be on here today. Thanks for having me on your channel. It's it's always great. And uh, lots of stuff going on. So I'm glad you picked this week to do these interviews. It's just such well, a dynamic situation. Well, and it worked out for us to be this week. So it actually worked out pr pretty advantageous for us. Uh, uh, hoping you're having a great Christmas. And I know uh, everybody here is, is having a great Christmas. But I want we got an hour here. I want to jump right into it right off the bat. So, Jay, you're going to talk to us about stock and what's going on with shipping. And uh, I, I, I don't even know where to begin, Jay. I really don't, because uh, we can do containers, we can do bulk, we can do tankers. I, I will I will let you decide where you want to go on this. Wow, an open-ended pathway. All right, well, this is going to be a great discussion. As far as I'm tracking, we, we're here for about an hour total, and I think we have time at the end uh, for Q&A. So if folks have any questions, feel free to type them in the uh, chat functionality, and, and we'll try to get those at the end. But yeah, what a wild, wild year, Sal. And it's really uh, more of the same. I mean, it's been a wild three or four years. Ever since COVID, even before COVID, there was crazy things going on with shipping. Uh, but the last than usual, we have the uh, Russia product and uh, diesel and oil sanctions ongoing throughout 2023. And then just when we thought things were starting to normalize, we got a drought situation in the Panama Canal that's, that's sort of been under a lot of folks' radars, I believe. And then very end of November, early December, we started getting uh, disruptions and some attacks in the Red Sea outside the Suez Canal. Um, and of course, that has exploded onto the mainstream. Lots of folks started talking about it about a week ago, 10 days ago, and the stocks have been gyrating up and down and, and all over the place. So yeah, there's a lot to talk about, Sal. Um, we've also had a lot of interesting uh, press releases and, and different sort of narratives from these companies um, over, the, over the past uh, few days as well. And, and, and just in time, you know, for the Christmas holidays, you know, we had the market closed on Monday and, and now we sort of normally the 26th, the day after Christmas, it's just such a boring day in the markets, right? I mean, and normally that's, you know, the folks who kind of forgot about it are getting their tax loss selling done. Um, a few folks are doing the final touches on, on their end of the year uh, positioning. And, and this is probably the most interesting and the most exciting last couple of weeks in December that I, that I can ever remember. So. I, I can't think of any either, Jay. I, I mean, with everything going on in the Red Sea, I, I mean, you have the Red Sea and the attacks going on, massive diversions of containers and, and tankers. Uh, we are seeing low levels in the Panama Canal. Uh, I, I think you got to go back to the 2020, 2021, 22 uh, supply chain uh, disruptions to really see where this is is been going on uh, in, in a level of disruptions like this. I mean, it's global. It is a global disruption. When Maersk announced that they were pulling out and it started the domino effect there, uh, we've just seen everything across the board go. So I, I, I'll pick one for you to start and that'll be containers because because you you have been the master of Zim for a long time. And and uh, for those who don't know, Zim is the uh, Israeli related container ship company, 10th largest in the world and obviously a big target going on. But in containers in general, of course, not just Zim. But uh, what's your what's your take been so far on what's going on with containers? Well, well big picture, Sal, with containers, we, we had such a disruption in, in 2020 with the COVID shutdowns. And then the rapid reopening, right? And we had all the consumer stimulus across Europe and the United States. And, and folks, remember what happened. Uh, shipping rates went absolutely ballistic. And, and those shipping rates went ballistic primarily for two reasons. Uh, first of all, we had port congestion across the United States and Europe, uh, primarily in, in Los Angeles. I mean, it was an unprecedented amount of port congestion. And at the same time, we had this huge amount of consumer demand. So you have consumer demand going up and you have supply artificially low uh, because of the congestion and those other issues. And of course, rates, supply and demand, right? So the rates went ballistic. And, and then we had just massive ordering of ships because the liners realized they were undersupplied. 
and, and the consumer money, consumer savings ran out. And so, of course, then we had the, the boom and bust of markets like we normally see. And from late 2022 throughout 2023, it was kind of a bust uh, scenario for most of the container ship markets. Well, that started to change about six, seven weeks ago. And, and a lot of that was being driven, again, both supply and demand. On the supply side, the, the Panama Canal drought was starting to worsen. The amount of ship transits were reduced. And in the United States, we finally had year-over-year inflections in consumer demand. And inflation is starting to calm down uh, in the United States. Uh, job markets have been very healthy. Consumers were returning to the stores over the uh, Black Friday holiday into, into uh, Christmas. And now, most recently, we're having all this news flow around the uh, Suez Canal and, and the Red Sea. So, so it's not as extreme as we saw in, in mid-2020 through 2021, right? It's not that epic of a demand surge, and it's not anywhere near as epic of a supply disruption, but we're seeing similar inflection points on both sides of the trade. Demand is very strong. Consumer demand is extremely healthy. Uh, the percent change is not you know, skyrocketing like it did last time, but the nominal level of consumer demand is very strong in the United States. And now we're seeing the uh, Suez Canal issues. And, and just to bring folks' memories back, to 2021, uh, we had a pretty tight container ship market and we had the Ever Given get stuck in the canal. And I know, Sal, you were all over that story, um, but that was just a few days. And those couple days of disruption in the Suez Canal led to two to three months or more of knock-on effects. And so what we're seeing now is not a Suez Canal closure, right? It, it's just uh, safety diversions, uh, things like that. But this is probably not gonna last three or four days like the Ever Given. This could go on potentially for months. So it's not a full 100% closure, but it's also a much longer uh, lasting impact. So that I think is very interesting for the computer ship story. Uh, Zim is ultra levered. And I, and I have a I have a long position in Zim again. I, I bought some in November as a seed oversold. So I, I got to disclose my positions and um, pump my bags and all that sort of thing. But I do have a, a, a position in Zim. It, it's fairly modest. It's pretty a small part, part of my portfolio. Uh, but Zim is ultra levered to the spot rates in shipping. So they're one of the companies that is positioned potentially, potentially, if uh, container freight rates keep going up, Zim's going to do really well. And, and Zim's also ultra short. The short interest is right now pretty much, I believe, at an all-time high. And, and so that's, that's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, Zim's not really one of my favorite positions at this point. It's a small position in my portfolio, but that's one way uh, where I am sort of positive or favorable on Uh, a couple of things real quick, Jay, there's a, a small tech issue, uh, getting a little bit about sound on your side. I'm not sure if your mic is fully up or not just a, a little bit. And so just may want to check that real quick. Uh, I, okay, I yeah. do think, I do think the issue on the containers. And as you mentioned with Zim, it's really interesting. Obviously they're at a low right now of where they've been. I think even prior to the IPO, but that's been a, a downward trend we've been seeing, but again, there's not a lot of publicly traded, uh, container firms out there. Uh, one of the things we have talked about in the past, I know we talked about this uh, last year, was a lot of the ancillary companies. And there's been a lot of movement in that sector too regarding container ownership and the container lesser sector. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that too and, and what's your view on, on what's going on that? I obviously had a big deal in that sector over the past year and, and what's happening with it going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I turned the mic up a little bit. So so hopefully that's coming through a little bit more clear uh, now. But on the liner side, yeah, there, there's not too many publicly traded uh, positions in the United States. There's Zim and there's another one called Matson, M-A-T-X, which is primarily focused on more protected uh, U.S. domestic trades. Uh, so they're primarily doing things like Puerto Rico and Hawaii and, and Alaska and, and stuff like that. So those are really your only two sort of liner stocks that you can get direct access to in the United States. Maersk, of course, is traded in Europe. Um, Hapag Lloyd is another name, but th those are a lot more thinly traded and, and only in Europe. Uh, as far as some of the related trades in, in containers, uh, one of my favorite sectors for a while, Sal, and I know we've talked about this uh, before, was the box lessors. And those are the financing companies, and I've talked about this a little bit before. They're, they're really more almost like banking plays, and they own those 20-foot and 40-foot container boxes, and they lease them to the liners. And, and that provides six, seven, eight, nine years of guaranteed cash flows. So those were companies that I loved. But sadly, Sal, well, I don't want to say sadly because it's, it's a success story for investors. But both of those companies have now been taken over, have been taken private. 
So apparently private equity, massive private equity firms uh, agreed with us. Uh, we had Stone Peak and Brookfield, respectively, uh, step in and buy out Textainer Group, TGH, and Triton, TRTN. So, so those companies are, are really no longer among us. So I'm disappointed because those were phenomenal companies, phenomenal investments, but I am pleased because I think it was a complete validation of, of that thesis. Now, those are the boxes. Very simple, right? More of a financing play. Now, there's also companies that are similarly structured that own the vessels, the ships themselves. Now, this market looked like it was going to start getting oversupplied. There's a massive order book coming in and, and throughout the end of 2023, and especially throughout 2024, massive deliveries. But anytime you have a disruption like we're seeing with the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, you're going to need more ships to handle the same amount of cargoes. So that, that significantly changed the potential supply dyna, uh, demand dynamics into 2024. So there's a lot of companies that own these ships and will benefit from leasing them, the liners. And it's a more of a lower risk, lower beta way to kind of play this story. And, and one company that I'm long, and I've mentioned it before in the past, is Denaus Corp, DAC. And that's been one of my top uh, personal positions. I, of course, I have a long position. Our models at Value Investors Edge uh, have long positions in, in Denaus Corp as well. Uh, but they lease the ships, these liners. And so that's a way to get sort of a uh, lower beta. If you look at the stock, it's not anywhere near as volatile as them, uh, but sort of a lower uh, risk uh, way to play that story. Unfortunately, the box lessers, they're gone. They've both get, been bought out. Uh, so that, that used to be my favorite sort of investment angle, investment pitch. Um, but now we just have to look at the ship owners. Uh, and let me say something about that because you brought that up a year ago. I mean, more than a year ago. I think we talked about it actually, the, the, the video before that. And I got into that and man, it was, it was a great investment. It was a good one. It was a really good one paid off really well. I got out before I too early, unfortunately, and, and, and didn't net what I should have, but it was still a great one. So I, I thought that was really interesting to see how that's played out and how that market's been changing. Obviously we're seeing a lot right now with what's going on in, in the Red Sea. Jay, let's talk about some tankers. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Uh, which way you want to go? Do you want to go with crude and dirty oil? Or you want to go with the, the the clean oil guys? Which one do you want to uh, talk about? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll have time to, to talk a little bit about both of those. Oh yeah, I mean, tankers are tankers are such an interesting story to me because the setup was already massively bullish before any of this stuff, before the Panama Canal, before the Suez Canal, before the Houthi, before anyone was talking about the Houthis. Uh, the tanker investments were looking very, very, very strong. In fact, 2023 was the strongest, uh, second strongest product tanker year in history. And of course, 2022, uh, with the inv Russian invasion of Ukraine and subsequent threats of sanctions, was the strongest year in history. So we just finished the second strongest, which was uh, 2023. And right before that, 2022 was record highs. Uh, those stocks, especially the product tanker stocks, have not produced enormous returns over the last year. And I, and I think that's because a year ago, folks had really, really high expectations and they set their sort of rate averages and, and such way too high. They set like impossible hurdles for these companies to clear. And, and folks were talking about multi-bagger returns and just not being realistic. And then I saw a lot of folks earlier this year uh, making what I believed were uh, erroneous year-over-year uh, -year comparisons. They're saying, well, the, the tanker rates are down 30% year-over-year. Well, yeah, but they're down 30% year-over-year against the strongest year in history. And so I think I think giving those markets a little bit more time to continue to tighten, continue to balance out is the right way forward on here. And and the best part about the tankers, Sal, and, and I know you already know this, but the order book, the forward order book, which is your forward supply, is almost nothing. In 2024, we're going to see the lowest amount of tanker deliveries, especially on the crude oil side, that we've ever seen in modern history. So you have a very tight market. You have disruptions starting to come forward and you have no relief valve on the supply side, no supply. And so that's just a recipe for, for enormous race, enormous strength of process. Yeah, I, I think especially when you start seeing diversions like we're seeing right now, there there is not the capacity out there to be able to go those extra ton miles and, and be able to pick it up. I mean, containers have that slack. I mean, because as you know, and you've talked about with the ship lessers, uh, lessees, excuse me, that they have that ability to get more ships. Container lines can throw more ships on it. They have tonnage coming in. It was a building spree of epic proportions, but it really supplanted any other thing else going on. And because tankers have been so low for so long, you know, when sh ships order new, I mean, ship owners order new ships when they have profits and they just have not had 
those huge amount of cash to be able to do it. And, and what we see is a very finite tanker fleet out there in both the, the, the crude oil sector and, and the clean sector. So I, I agree. I, I think I think you're hitting on a key topic right there. Yeah, and, and I would differentiate a little bit because, you know, there's it's two sectors, but they correlate together, of course. A clean, as you said, being diesel, jet fuel, gasoline, things like that. And the other tankers primarily just being regular crude oil. And the crude oil tankers have the most bullish order book that I've ever seen of any sector of any time in shipping, certainly in my career, arguably even my entire lifetime. And, and, it, and like I mentioned, there's no supply growth. And secondly, the existing fleet is the oldest it's been in about 20 years. So not only is there no forward supply, no new ships to replenish the global fleet, the, the ships that are on the water are getting older and older as we speak. And then additionally, and, and this is not top of anyone's mind right now because everyone's talking about Red Sea and Houthis, but there are enormous environmental regulations hitting the market. Uh, there's something called EEXI, uh, which is a design index for ships. There's a CII, which is a carbon intensity index. And those initiatives started in 2023. But 23 was sort of a baseline test year, evaluation year. And 2024 is the first year where we start to see penalties and, and restrictions on, on how fast these ships can move. So the real impact doesn't even start until 24. Each year, 24, 25, 26, 27, those restrictions become more and more stringent. Additionally, in Europe, uh, starting in about a week now, there will be a uh, emissions carbon trading system, which is going to act basically as a tax on these vessels. And the more emissions they have, the higher the tax is going to become. So this will encourage vessels, especially those trading throughout Europe, to move slower and slower in order to become uh, more efficient on the emissions curve. So when you think about the impact of all these environmental regulations, it's going to synthetically, sort of artificially, reduce the available uh, global supply. And there's no new builds coming on to, to relieve that. So that we were extremely, and I say we, uh, our team at Valley Investors Edge, we were extremely bullish on tankers before any of this happened, before the Panama, before the the Suez Canal stuff. So this is just extra fireworks at the show, right? And and this is just potentially driving stuff even higher. Now, what we haven't seen yet, Sal, and I don't want to jump ahead too much, but we haven't seen anywhere near as many tanker diversions or disruptions around the Suez Canal. It's almost primarily been the container ships. And I think that's just, there's a, there's a function of a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the average cargo value on the tankers is probably 50 million, 60 million, depends on how you price out uh, the products and, and the crude oil prices. Whereas the average value on some of these container ships can be two, three, four, five billion dollars. So a significantly different amount of, of cargo, which means the insurance premiums price out differently. The customer demands are different. Um, a lot of the end clients of container firms are more risk averse. Right, think about major global retailers, right? They don't want to be associated with potential loss of ship, loss of cargo, loss of life. Whereas some of the commodities, oil, gasoline, diesel, are more controlled by commodities traders who are all sorts of different entities and can maybe more easily distance themselves uh, from any negative effects. And finally, the tanker market is far, far tighter. The tankers start diverting, uh, we're going to see rates go ballistic overnight. Whereas the container fleet, as you mentioned, Sal, it had a lot more slack in it. But even that, Sal, even with that slack in the container fleet, we've seen freight futures uh, for multiple routes around the world, out of China, out of Europe, all sorts of places. Some of those have doubled or tripled even in the last few weeks. And so if that's, contain if that's what happens to container freight from their disruptions, imagine the potential we could see in tanker markets if those ships also start diverting. Hey, I think you're exactly right. What you're seeing divert around the Red Sea are container ships. And again, if you're paying 0.7% war risk insurance on the total value of your cargo, that's substantially more for a container ship than what you're doing for a crude oil tanker or even a gas carrier. Uh, it, it just It's substantially more. And the ships we're seeing hit, are, ironically, are bulk carriers and tankers, uh, which they can basically absorb the hits, actually, based on what the Houthi are using. So I, I think you're right that that's that we haven't seen those big diversions yet. And like you said, we don't have the ships to really support diversion like this. The reason we built super tankers was literally because the Suez Canal closed for eight years from 1967 to 75. And that's the reason you saw the construction 
of those massive tankers. But uh, I got to say, again, I'm going to come back to talks we've had where you talked about this market. And, and I got to say, I got, I think I got into, I had a note up there about TK tankers, talk about TK. You know, I got into TK, I think I think I bought like $15 a share at the time. And so it was it was really low at the time. And, and so uh, just like you said, uh, I remember a, a thing you said, it, it can't get lower. I mean, it's pretty much at the bottom as it is. Uh, what are you looking at now for the tankers? I mean, what's 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 your prospects in that area? What do you what are you thinking that's happening? I know it's hard to, to to read the tea leaves and everything that's going on right now because it's just an insane world when it comes to shipping. Yeah, well, it's it's always difficult to uh, make predictions, <laughs> so uh, don't hold me too far to these. But uh, of course, you remember Sal? We we always we've interviewed and done these discussions in the past and. Hold my feet to the fire as, as it may in a, in a few months. Well, uh, I, I tell you what, before before I get you into that, Jay, because I I, I, want, yeah. I do want to hold the predictions to the end. Uh, but there was a question that came up, and and I want to reference it again: the role of the dark fleet. Uh, that you know, we've seen the proliferation of that with Russia, and obviously the dark fleet's this nebulous little thing. It, it, how would you gauge the dark fleet affecting tanker sector out there in terms of stocks and and what's going on out there? I, I think you're exactly right about the emissions issues. That's the big issue we're looking at right now. The reason you can't put the hammer down on the throttles for ships is because of emissions, because you're going to get yourself in trouble and you don't want to get that high score on that emissions. And all of a sudden you're doing eight knots for the rest of the year to make up for that. I, I think there's a lot of play in that, but the dark fleet seems to be one that's really throwing a lot into the, the, the works right now. Yeah. And, and that's a great question, Sal. And, and, and the dark fleet has had, two different types of effects. I mean, if we go back to 2022, mid 22, late 22, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it was clear that there was massive sanctions on the way, right? And they didn't end up starting until the end of November 22. And the uh, product tanker sanctions didn't end up starting until February of 2023. And in fact, uh, the case study of those sanctions was one of the uh, articles in my recently defended dissertation. So I, I spent a lot of time looking at this uh, studying the AI AIS uh, flows, which are basically GPS for ships, uh, looking at the cargo diversions, looking at those impacts. And, and there's other folks that have done this as well. So I'm not you know, the end-all be-all expert on, on this sort of thing, but strictly from an investment perspective, because that's what we're here to kind of talk about today and, and talking about our investment research and, and the stocks and stuff that we follow. The initial impact of the emergence of the so-called dark fleet was extremely bullish for tanker markets, especially for those companies that own the sort of aging, outdated tonnage, and perhaps wanted to sell some of that tonnage. And so some of these companies had the opportunity to divest their older ships, the 15-year tonnage, 15-year-plus ships that would otherwise be going obsolete. And they had a chance to sell those ships at basically almost, almost all-time record highs for those ships. In fact, in some cases, uh, companies were selling ships. They'd own the ship for 10 years, and they were selling it for more than they paid 10 years so just unprecedented amounts of stuff. And you'd mentioned TK tankers earlier. Uh, TK tankers sold a couple of their uh, ships and, and they sort of benefited a lot from having an older fleet. And now, Sal, now that we're into the end of 23, so now we're a year along, a year and a half along, if anything, the dark fleet has turned to more of a headwind, uh, more of a negative for the tanker sector. And the reason that is, is because those older ships in a normal market, in a tier one market, where we're doing legal trades between major counterparties, you know, oil majors, Exxon, Chevron, Shell, um, all those companies, uh, direct trade with the United States and, and other major ports, those ships would either not be allowed uh, to access some of those ports, or they would have to pay ex a much higher cost to do their surveys, to the dry docks. The oil majors wouldn't even want to deal with any of the ships that are over 15, especially not those that are over 20. But now those older ships have a home in the dark fleet where these surveys and these regulations and these restrictions are, are not necessarily adhered to as much. So it, it's kind of funny, the dark fleet turned from a major sort of tailwind positive thing for the sector, and now I view it as, as net negative. Uh, so it's, it's really kind of shifted in that way. Because I'd like to see those ships demolished, because if those ships get demolished or scrapped or expensive retrofits are done, that will continue to hold down the supply side. Yeah, I you know I did a story earlier in the year about a tanker, the Pablo, that blew up off the coast of Malaysia, and it was pretty clear it had to do with the inert gas system not being operative on the ship. This is what keeps the ship safe, 
And you're right. I, I think they're running ships way past where they would, which would usually drive replacement value. And and, and as you said, if, if you're not replacing, and matter of fact, we're seeing ships actually phase out of the dark fleet back probably over into in, into the commercial se sector because again, with oil coming down, it, it's you're seeing those ships more, and there's more reduction being against them. We're seeing the Greeks coming against them, a lot more sanctions by the U.S. government against them. So there's a lot more trying to get that dark fleet under some sort of control. But you're doing these ship-to-ship -ship transfers out in the middle of places they shouldn't be doing them. So you're right. I, I do think that's a, that's a, an interesting argument about where they are in that sector. Uh, what about what we're seeing with the reductions from, from OPEC? And we saw OPEC Plus come down with their reductions. We saw Russia come down with their reductions. How is that impacting the market? At the same time, we'll talk about uh, LNG and LPG here in a second, where you have the U.S. becoming the largest energy producer in the world. And what does that mean for the movement across the, the sectors? Yeah, well, both those impacts kind of go in opposite directions of each other. Uh, we'll start with OPEC in the order that you mentioned. The OPEC plus cuts are quite clearly going to be a negative, and they have been a negative, a little bit of a drag on the tanker sector. But keep in mind, those cut levels, most of them were already initiated in June or July of 2023. So most of those cuts are simply being continued uh, from the OPEC plus countries. And we've seen how strong the tanker rates have been throughout 2023, second strongest year in history, and that is already with those cuts. So it just goes to show how strong and how balanced uh, the current tanker market now, so that, that's been a bit of a headwind. Ideally, we would love, as tanker investors and folks who look at just the supply and demand of tankers, we want to see as much oil on the water as possible, and we want to see the longest routes possible. Because the way you measure shipping demand is not just total oil right, or total consumption, it's the ton miles, how much oil is getting shipped and how far it's going. And that leads into sort of the second part of your question there, Sal, is, is what does record North American specifically United States oil production mean for tankers. And, and that's the really bullish side of the story. That's that's the positive side. And that's because almost all of that oil is being exported out of the Gulf of Mexico. And a lot of it is going to Asia. And if you look at the difference in the route from the Middle East Gulf to China, India, versus US Gulf, China, Korea, Japan, India, much, much further. And it's much further if you can use the Panama Canal. If you can't use the Panama Canal, then the distances go up even further yet. So this is a very bullish thing that's happening in the uh, tanker sector as sort of the U.S. exports are supplanting sort of the legacy OPEC supply. Uh, I'd like to see strong supply from both sources. So that'd be my favorite. My favorite uh, bullish case would be that OPEC uh, reduces uh, some of their cuts. I, I mean, the most bullish thing would be if OPEC goes back to their, they dust off their early 2020 playbook and, and, and try to start some sort of oil price war. I mean, that would be, that would be phenomenally bullish. Uh, but right now we have the, the headwind, uh, which is the OPEC plus cuts, which are continuing. And we have the positive tailwind of increasing U.S. production and U.S. exports. So you've seen the rate sell, the rates speak for themselves. And again, 2023, second strongest year in history. And mid-sized tanker rates last week were up another 25%. So, so it's a very, very strong market. Yeah, I, I think if you're looking at, you know, Torm, Ardmore, uh, Scorpio. I mean, you look at all those, what has happened here recently, you see them all kind of ticking up. I mean, that's definitely what you're seeing on those MR, LR, and when we say MR, medium range, long range, these are the mid-sized tankers that are ideally suited for carrying refined petroleum products. We're not talking about the large, ultra large uh, containers, the very large uh, crude carriers or the Aframax, Suez Max vessels that tend to carry the uh, uh, crude petroleum through it. Uh, Jay, we were talking about LNG and LPG. Let's talk about that sector a little bit because that's been really interesting. Obviously, one of the backdrops here that's going on is those reductions in the Panama Canal. Uh, we've seen the Panama Canal go down to about a two-thirds level of vessel passage through it. But I think the main issue has been the big lane, the Neo-Panamax lane, uh, and, and the delays in getting through. And, and that's really been the issue. And, and this has caused a lot of American petroleum carriers, a lot of gas carriers, and a lot of bulk carriers coming out of the United States to sit there and say, well, I'm going to go through the Suez. Well, that all changes uh, in, in a way uh, because of what's happening. And it's caused, again, this, this kind of variable into the marketplace. You actually have 
at this point, people bidding for spots into the Panama Canal, you know, which normally is costing you about three hundred thousand dollars to go through a Panama Canal. Now you're you're paying up to three to four million dollars to get a berth through the Panama Canal because of the Panama Canal lottery. So let's talk about that LPG LNG sector. And I know you look at not just the ships in this, but other areas in this sector. Yeah, of course, Sal. And, and it, this is interesting because normally I mentioned how the crude tankers and product tankers are different sectors and segments, but they kind of correlate. Well, normally the gas markets are, are at least partially correlated as well. Uh, where one goes, they both sort of go. And, and this year, especially this fall and this winter, as we enter the winter of the 23 and the 24, the markets are going in opposite directions. Uh, the LNG market is, is coming off a massive boom period. After the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Europe realized they got to diversify their sources. They realized LNG is going to become critically important to the supply of that continent. And there was massive investment in, in new uh, regasification and import uh, terminals. There was massive investment into securing more LNG carriers. And so rates went very, very high over the last couple of years in LNG carriers. Now we're getting to the point where the uh, European winter last year was way more mild than, than folks thought it might be. Uh, this year, it hasn't shaped, hasn't shaped up to be very cold as well. Um, Asian import growth isn't growing as fast as it has over the last few years. There's been a lot of new vessels hitting the water. Uh, the LNG rates right now, Sal, are not anything to, to really uh, write home about or brag about. It's a very mediocre uh, start to the winter in LNG rates. So let's set that aside and start looking at LPG, liquefied uh, petroleum gas, basically propane. And let's look at what the rates there are doing. Completely opposite story. Uh, rates have been skyrocketing. Rates are at or near all-time record highs. And the big factor for this is, first of all, the order book for LPG was much smaller than LNG. So we're not getting flooded with an endless supply of ships like we have on the other side of the market. We're also seeing demand growth, robust dem demand growth continue in China, uh, continue in India. Uh, China has open, uh, been opening some new... Uh, plants that will convert propane into uh, rubber and, and other sort of petrochemicals. And so that has driven up their demand uh, for LPG. And finally, and really it's just the spark that, that kind of lit the uh, fire here, is the disruptions around the Panama Canal. By far, the uh, LPG ships, the VLGCs, the very large gas carriers, depend upon that Panama Canal transit to bring the cargoes from the U.S. Gulf over to China. And they are by far the segment that is being hit the hardest uh, by this uh, disruption. It's not a closure, but it is a, it is a significant reduction in throughput. And so the backdrop for the LPG markets is extremely strong. And if, if someone you know is listening along today or listening to a recording later, uh, just so you can get an example of this, you can look up Dorian LPG, stock symbol LPG, and you can throw that in the chart and just see what that company has done uh, over the last few months. And, and so that's that strength in the market is already, I think, pretty fully reflected in the stock prices, uh, but it's really just a tale of two, uh, two segments here, and they're going in different directions. Uh, the LNG outlook, the more and more I look at it, the worse and worse it looks, and the LPG outlook, uh, every time I turn around, we're seeing uh, more and more impressive rates and fixtures. Sorry, trying to get that. Yeah, I, I think again that chart was just showing uh, where LPG and LNG tankers are in the world, and you can see really, you know, that density coming out of the United States, coming out of the Middle East, coming out of Australia, and and, and where they're heading uh, around right now. So I, I think that's a, a a good indicator. The the other element, obviously, of course, is the bulk sector, and this has been a sector that hasn't been gravely impacted at all by what's happening in the Red Sea. We're still seeing bulk carriers go. But again, we're getting the impact in the Panama Canal right now from uh, the inability to get through there. So this has been a big issue. I would also add uh, this is a sector that's really dependent on inland waterways. We've seen this with low water levels in the Mississippi River. We've seen it down in South America. We've seen it in Europe. And of course, what's going on in the other war that's going on in another colored sea, the Black Sea, and the ability to get bulk carriers out of there. So I thought you'd talk a little bit about that bulk sector and, and where we're seeing that sector moving right along. Yeah, well, it's it's good time to talk about that, Sal. And, and as I've mentioned in, in previous discussions, uh, both on your channel and, and elsewhere, uh, dry bulk is generally a play on China. There's such an uh, overweighted impact uh, to the dry bulk rates, depending on how much iron ore and coal and other commodities that China wants to import. 
But these Panama Canal disruptions uh, are, are definitely positively impacting the dry bulk markets. Uh, some of the seasonality and grain trades is also playing out. And, and, and just to differentiate a little bit here between what's going on with the Panama Canal and Suez Canal. So the Suez Canal is involuntarily uh, reducing the amount of traffic. I mean, it is not, you can't pay more money to, to get more cargoes through. You can bid for a slot to get through, um, but it's not an open market. It's not a, a free system where shipping companies can just pay more money and force more ships through. That's not happening. There's a set quota on how many transits can be done per day, and it's down roughly 50% from previous levels. And that's that's involuntarily. You can't just pay up more money or accept more risk and shove your ship through the canal. The Suez Canal is completely opposite. It's a voluntary system where the actual canal itself is, is more or less working just fine. It's a matter of whether or not you want to accept that risk, the risk to your crew, the risk to your cargoes. And, and we talked earlier about the value of the cargoes on each ship. And by far, the dry bulk car carriers have the lowest average value of cargo. And so a lot of these dry bulk carriers couldn't even really afford the canal fees to go through the Suez Canal to begin with. So I think you have your AIS chart up there uh, in front of you, Sal. And, and of course, you'll see that even before the Red Sea disruptions, uh, the, the dry bulk carriers heavily would go around uh, Africa. It, it wasn't as common for them to go through the Suez Canal. And that's because, first of all, the value of the cargo is not very high. They can't really afford to pay the canal fees. And, and second of all, when you're, when you're shipping a load of, of coal or iron ore or bauxite, it, it's not super time sensitive. These things are planned months in advance. It's not the same as when you're shipping retail goods to the stores. You've got to get them on the shelves now, right? Just in time inventory and all that sort of thing. So it's a totally different type of cargo. Um, but on the Suez Canal side, the vessels we're seeing that were our, that had previously used that route, they're still using that route. And they haven't responded as much to the safety concerns. And you know, I think that's, that's morally wrong uh, of these companies for not considering the safety of their crew and, and the safety of their cargoes. But the economics and, and, and the, the customers of these vessels drive a lot of these decisions. And it's not the same as the container ship sector where you have these large multinational companies with billions of dollars of cargo and, and major uh, forward-facing retailers and such that are involved. So I think that the liners are, are taking a more uh, pragmatic and more cautious, more risk-averse approach to what's going on in the Red Sea, where the tankers are just pushing through. I think it's wrong, but they're doing that. And I think the dry bulk carriers, the majority are just doing what they've always done, which is divert. So not a lot of changes. And, and the min minority that would already use the Suez Canal are still using it. So I think dry bulk is probably the least impacted uh, by the Suez Canal. In fact, I don't really see any evidence that it's being uh, impacted at all. Uh, but I do think the Panama Canal is a positive factor for dry bulk. And if you look at some of the uh, dry bulk rates, uh, the, the latest quote, now the Baltic dry index, they're, they're the, uh, the Baltic exchange is, is the uh, company brokerage in, in Europe that sets these rates and publishes them. They're closed on holiday sell. So we won't be able to find out exactly what the rates are for another week. So the rates that I'm quoting now are from last Friday. So they're, they're slightly outdated as we're talking here on Tuesday. Uh, but the Cape size rates were $30,000 a day, which is 61% higher than last year and is one of the strongest Decembers and strongest average Decembers that we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years. One of the strongest. And so the dry bulk market is actually doing pretty decently well. And the Panama Canal is positively impacting it. But when folks start asking about, you know, Red Sea and Suez Canal, I, I don't really think that's much of a story for dry bulk. I, I think you're right. I, I, I have to agree with, with the, the bulk sector and the way it's running right now. And again, I was showing just the big bulkers at that time because it's there's a lot of bulk. The bulk is the most numerous ships out there. And so you get a sea of green on the, on that chart if you don't clean it up a little bit. But you get an idea of where the big movement is going on right now in that sector. Uh, Jay, we're coming in the last 20 minutes here. So I want to make sure I give enough time for you uh, to talk a little bit about what your predictions are. Well, let me ask you something. Let's reflect for a second. We're a year since we talked last time. We've been doing pretty good at getting these in about every year. Uh, what was the thing that surprised you the most over the past year? I know there's a lot right there, and 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 and, but beyond the the, the craziness that is invasions and attacks and, and 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 disruptions, was there anything that really struck you over the past year that you sat there and said, "Well, that did, did not see that one coming," or this had more of an effect or less of an impact than I thought it would? I think the obvious easy answer to what I didn't have on my bingo card was uh, the resurgence and emergence and resurgence in different waves 
uh, of the Houthis in Yemen. So I think that's the obvious one. I, I think that surprised kind of everybody. Um, that that's more recent, um, but bigger picture, uh, Sal. I think I think the biggest uh, theme for us, and this this was up until I would say about November, was the uh, lackluster dry bulk season. Um, the trade or the the storyline into the end of 2022 was that when China abandoned the zero COVID policy and reopened, we would see potential um, economic stimulus programs. We would see recoveries in China and we would see a huge resurgence in dry bulk demand. For the first 10-ish months of the year, we didn't see that. It, it was disappointing for dry bulk. So if you would have asked me two months ago, Jay, what's the most surprising or disappointing thing about 2023, it would have been dry bulk. Uh, just, it was a lot weaker uh, than I would have thought it would have been. Um, but the reason why I'm, I'm having all these caveats is, is dry bulk was really strong in November and it was damn strong in December. And, and the Panama Canal has really contributed a lot to that. Some of the seasonal shifting patterns of grain trades has contributed to that. Uh, China's actually, uh, if you look at their import levels, our macro analyst, uh, James Catlin studied a lot of this, their actual import levels did go up a lot. It was just, they, they were so much slack in the dry bulk uh, fleet from as the congestion unwound. China sort of started to absorb that slack and it wasn't enough to move the rates. Uh, so, so now dry bulk is, is, is kind of like where we hoped it would be, where we expected it would be. It just took so damn long. It took, it took 10 or 11 months to get there instead of two or three. Uh, so that's, that's one of the biggest ones, Sal, that I would say was, was sort of a surprise to us. And then sort of from, and this isn't so much macro level, this is more stock market level, but another sort of surprise or disappointment of 2023 is sort of the lackluster performance of a few product anchor stocks. And, and to see these stocks, a lot of them barely up year over year, even though we've had the second strongest year in history, even though a lot of these companies are heavily repurchasing stock, paying large dividends, um, that, that's a little disappointing and that's a little surprising. And I think when you start peeling back the layers and, and answering the why behind that, I, I think investors just set up super unrealistic expectations uh, for these companies. I think a lot of folks maybe got in early and already had doubled or tripled their money. So now they waited right for the one year capital gains and they got to their one year mark and they started selling their positions and locking in gains. And, and that's smart. Uh, nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, so I think there's some some reasonable explanations why. Uh, but from a stock market perspective, I, I've been really disappointed in, in the lackluster product tanker stocks. And, and that's why they remain uh, some of my favorites today, because I think the valuations are great. Yeah, I got to agree with you on the, on the bulk sector, particularly. Uh, I was surprised by that myself. Uh, kept watching that resurgence, waiting for it to happen. Like I said, November and December were great. I, I mean, I've got Eagle. I've been watched it the whole time and, you know, watched a pretty lackluster year. And then all of a sudden, a little bit of a resurgence there. And, and so it, it's been interesting to watch. And again, I think a lot of that has to do with downward production, uh, maybe a move offshore uh, or reshoring some 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 production back to the United States, maybe finding other sources other than China. But China's the behemoth. You know, again, China imports more than it exports. And we tend to forget that, especially when it comes to raw material and resources. And they're just a massive consumer of goods. And, and when they slow down a little bit, that has an impact across the market that you tend to see uh, all the time. All right. Well, Jay, let's talk a little bit about what you see going forward. And, you know, uh, what James predicted, I got to go back to one thing, because you mentioned James there a minute ago. Man, what his his write-up just after, I think it was the December 3rd attacks was excellent. I thought that was a really great write-up. Uh, I thought he was spot on. I thought he was nailing some things that a lot of people were not looking at. And and again, I'll have this up here for everybody, but this is uh, Jay's site. This is the Value Investors Edge site. I had that link in the show notes. I'll post it again there for you to go take a look at it. And we'll let Jay talk about this in a minute. But I, I just wanted to have that out there for everybody. So Jay, I, I thought we'll talk about predictions now, maybe for a minute, get you to kind of talk about what you uh, foresee coming forward. And, and, and again, you know, we will hold your feet to the fire, you know, later on and, and, and see how good you are. Uh, about this. But, you know, I, I think you, you know, again, what we're doing here today is talking about the economic side of shipping stocks. We're not talking about pluses and minuses of what's going on uh, around the world. So we're really kind of talking about the economics. And if people have specific questions, please post them. I'll have them up here for Jay to address at the end. So Jay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What do you think? Yeah, no, it's it, it, on the spot it, it, as, uh, as I'm accustomed to being. Uh, we're getting ready for 2024. So my team and I, and for those who are just joining or listening to recording later who aren't familiar uh, 
with Valley Investors Edge. It's a boutique research platform that focuses exclusively on maritime shipping, related energy infrastructure. We, we cover some offshore stuff as well. We have a team of 11, uh, including five full-time analysts. So it's, it's not just myself. Uh, I'm, I'm the founder of Valley Investors Edge, but we have a head of shipping research, uh, Clement Mullins, who probably some folks are familiar with. Uh, James Catlin is our head of macro research. Uh, we brought in a new guy, Henrik Alex. Well, not a new guy, but it, recently added to our team, Henrik Alex, to cover offshore. So it's an extensive team. So our team right now has spent the last two weeks uh, assembling our top ideas for 2024. And that list is still being curated as we speak because things have been so dynamic. So, so that list is actually going to be published to our members on, on Thursday afternoon of this week. So just two days from now. Um, so it wouldn't be fair uh, to, you know, to say all those names right now or, or anything like that. That's, that's wouldn't be proper. The list isn't even, it, the list is in pencil right now and it hasn't even been published. Uh, so, we'll, so I'll stay high level. Uh, I'll stay pretty high level on, on some of the predictions and, and themes I'm looking at. And then maybe I'll mention one or two stocks that, that I have a long position in that I, that I've set myself up for a trade or potential investment of. Uh, so one of the things I'm really looking for into 2024 is an epic continual tightening of the tanker trade. And I think a lot of folks at the end of 2022 just set these unrealistic expectations for rates of how fast it was going to develop, of how long the market uh, or how strong the market was going to be. We had a great year, but I think people weren't happy with, with great. They wanted bombastic out of this world uh, sort of a uh, uh, year. And we, we didn't quite get that. We had a very strong year. I think 2024 is likely to be far stronger than 2023. So that's that's prediction, I guess, number one it is, I don't know if it's gonna be strong. 2022 was the strongest in all history. So I don't know if it's gonna be stronger than 22, but I think 2024 is going to be much stronger than 23. It'll either be the second strongest or the strongest year in history for tanker stocks, uh, or for the tanker rates. Now, of course, stocks are, are you know human nature and, and who knows exactly the psychology of where those will go. Uh, but I'm very, very bullish on tankers. And it's no secret. I, I've shared the uh, thesis many, many times. Um, one of the names that I've shared publicly, again, I'll, I'll stick with names that I've already shared publicly, just to be fair to everybody. Uh, but one of the names I've talked about on the product tanker side is Scorpio Tankers, S-T-N-G. I have a long position in, in that name. And I think at this juncture, re recording on 26th uh, December 2023, I, I think that stock in the, in the product tanker sector is the best position, the best valued they have the most modern fleet. They've done massive buybacks earlier this year. And as geopolitical events started unfolding, uh, their management team decided, hey, you know what? We're going to pay down debt all the way down to ridiculously low levels, like scrap values. And that way, no matter what happens, we have optionality. They're going to hit that juncture, I believe, around April, May of next year. Might be sooner if, if the rates take off. And once that happens, I think we're going to see a return of massive repurchases, maybe larger dividends. So I really like Scorpio tankers longer term under that theme, talking about 2024 being an amazing year for tankers. I have a trade right now. This isn't necessarily like a long-term investment. I don't want to get married to it. I want, to, I want everyone to be clear that this is more of a trade, uh, but I have a long position, a very long position in Nordic American tankers, NAT. I actually added to that position a little bit more this morning uh, during today's pullback. And I think NAT is uniquely poised to benefit, not just from the rising tanker rates, but also uniquely uh, poised to benefit from these Suez Canal disruptions. Their entire fleet is Suez Max tankers, which are purposely designed to go through that Suez Canal. So if that Suez Canal gets disrupted any further, if, if the speed of average vessel transit goes down, if there's any sort of uh, delays for like protecting convoys and things like that on the other side, on the Red Sea, uh, that has the potential to spike Suez Max rates way up. Uh, this was not my prediction. It was an article in Tradewinds. I believe it was based on a commentary from Clarkson's, but they said Suez Max rates could potentially reach $200,000 per day. Uh, last, uh, last week, Suez Max rates went up about 12%. They were at 60000 per day. 60000 is is an amazingly strong rate. And, and I don't want to predict 200000 I think that's probably a little bit hyperbolic. I think maybe six figures, 100000 110000 is probably more potentially realistic. Uh, but if that's true, if we see six-figure Suez Max and other mid-sized tanker rates, uh, then I think NAT has enormous potential upside as a trade. I want to make that clear. It's, it's a trade. It's, it's shorter term. So that's theme number one, Sal. Uh, the tankers are being very strong in 24. We talked about an investment idea longer term, and we talked about a trade. I don't want to just keep battling on, Sal, so maybe we just stop with that one and, and see if there's any follow-ups. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a really good one to, to look at. And again, I... 
I follow along with you, and I think that's a good one. I should also mention, too, that that you know I, I asked Jay to come on. I, I, Jay's not sponsoring this by any way, so I, I just you know I enjoy having Jay come on. He's been a longtime subscriber to the channel, supporter for the channel. But this is this is my opportunity to get that kind of expertise, and that's why I want this week to be. And that was the reason. There was a couple of comments that I just wanted to make sure I addressed in 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 the notes here. So no, I, I think that that sector is looking good. And again, I don't want you to make any predictions that you're holding for your your subscribers. Obviously, I, I think that's uh, something that you need to do. Uh, I think looking at some other long term issues, uh, you know, you get the geopolitical. What are some things we should be looking for? You know, that are, that are good tells for you. Like, okay, the shipping market's about to, you know, obviously we've got the Houthi, and that's a that's a big one. But what's some of the things that you're looking for right now that, you know, if this happens next, this is going to cause a change in the market one way or the other when it comes toward shipping? Yeah, I, I think the two things people should be watching right now in, in terms of disruptions, I think, number one, uh, folks can look at it's, it's called the Gatton Lake. It's the lake that feeds into the Panama Canal. And so whenever the Panama Canal uses these systems of locks, right, different levels of water to transit the canal, it requires usage of this fresh water from the lake. And these lake water levels are season at seasonally adjusted lows, very, very low, some of the lowest we've ever seen. And, and that data can be monitored for free online. You can Google it and find different graphs and charts of it. So I think that's one thing folks can monitor because the lower that lake goes on a seasonally adjusted basis, the longer the Panama Canal is going to be disrupted. We have a massive uh, rainstorm and, and such uh, next year as we get into next spring, summer, and we start getting uh, different weather patterns. Uh, that could change, but that's something to watch. Uh, I, I think folks should pay very close attention to not the headlines necessarily, right? Like not necessarily the letters that some of these companies are publishing to their clients to try to reassure their clients, um, but we should pay attention to the actual amount of container ship throughput through the Red Sea. And I, and I mentioned sort of the letters that these companies published to their clients because we had a very interesting one over the weekend, uh, right ahead of Christmas, uh, Maersk put out a letter and, and Maersk is the world's largest container ship company or, or right up there with MSC. They're kind of neck, neck and neck for the largest company. But Maersk was leading the charge to divert their vessels away from the Red Sea and talking about safety concerns. And then very oddly, um, basically on Christmas Eve, they published a letter primarily to their customers, sort of reassuring their customers and saying, well, we're going to, we feel better now that the U.S. Uh, protection group is there. We're going to send some of our ships back. Um, but they're talking about a handful of ships. And this is a company that operates hundreds of ships. So I, I think the second thing I would watch now is, is the actual throughput of vessels. And I know you're doing a great job doing that, Sal. So subscribe to Sal's channel and, and he'll keep you updated and, and follow the right folks on Twitter. Those, those are the two things I, I I'd sort of watch and, and sort in terms of disruption. Now, geopolitically, Sal, I don't want to get too far out of my lane and into predictions there. I've seen some crazy stuff on, on Twitter, Sal. Twitter, uh, X, oh, yeah. I should say X. I mean, I've seen some nonsense out there, like people saying the Persian Gulf is going to be closed and the Houthis are going to beat the U.S. Navy. I've seen some insane stuff on Twitter. And, and so I don't want to get too far out of my lane uh, on that stuff. Well, you hit a couple of things, Jay, right there. So number one, I am such a massive loser that i have on my phone an app that gives me the Katoon lake water levels i actually have that like like my weather is like i have an option on my weather for panama what, what's going on in panama so that i can watch it because th this is what i this is this is what i look at all the time i i think the mayor's thing you said is a really interesting one i had a conversation with somebody this morning about this and I think Maersk is really interesting because you're right. They led the charge. They just they 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 went away, and now they're coming back. But if you look at what they're doing, it's it's like ten ships coming out of Europe, coming through the Suez, heading southbound, and like two or three heading to the Suez. And 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 to me, that's repositioning. They're repositioning containers. They want to sweep up empty containers out of Europe, get them over to Asia, so that they can stuff them again and send them to the ships, largely going on the diversion route. Because again, one of the things that's going on right now is right now, as of January 1st, they reset the long-term rates for ocean carriers between Europe and Asia. And so if they can keep the diversion going, that allows them to get better rates. And, and these are the type of things that I, I know Jay and I look at all the time when it comes to shipping because container liners will work long-term rates, whereas the tanker market, LNG, LPG, is more spot. I mean, it's more lifts and, and what's available at the time. So it's a different market. And a lot of people who will invest in shipping don't understand the nuances of that. 
in some ways that that you know shipping you know container shipping is is very much like the airline schedule it's all said it's 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 cut and paste the this this ship's leaving on this day at that time whereas tankers are are going to where the money is and, and, and they're always kind of flipping around that way so all right well we're coming up in the last five minutes jay so i want to give you an opportunity uh to, 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 to wrap up in case i didn't cut cover anything for you i want to make sure you have an opportunity uh uh to hit on any topic that i did not get a chance to do and i'm going to take one last look through the comments here and see if there's any good questions for you yeah well, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's lots of great questions that every time we do one of these or there's a chance for for live questions i, I always see some great stuff so I'm happy to extend a few minutes uh, to answer some questions if there are some. Um, I think the other sort of interesting theme and dynamic into 2024 is going to be the volatility. I think we're going to see extreme volatility in container ship uh, freight costs. Now, I'm not necessarily making a strong bullish nor bearish prediction, uh, but I am making a prediction on volatility. I think we're going to see rates skyrocket up and down throughout the first few months of 24. And I think we'll see stocks like Zim. Uh, just continue to be massive battleground stocks for traders. We're talking about short interest at record highs. We're talking about freight rates being volatile in both directions. We're talking about a global sort of narrative uh, around the container freight and, and around uh, what Maersk is, is doing and what these other container ship companies are doing. Uh, so I think that excitement and, and that volatility is going to be here with us. Uh, now, I have a small, long uh, trading position in Zim. Uh, both in common stock and also in uh, some January options, getting a little spicy there. And so I'm going to have fun uh, trading that one. We'll see how it turns out. Uh, but I, I think Zim's going to be exciting, Sal. And I think fundamentally speaking, I think tankers are really the place to be. And, and interestingly enough, Sal, uh, a lot of the tanker stocks, one or two of them responded, but a lot of the tanker stocks are barely up or flat month over month, despite everything that's happening. And that is cr absolutely crazy to me. Um, I am extremely bullish on tankers and, and and might be just as bullish as I've been over the last couple of years on tankers. Yeah. Could, could you, uh, we had a question about a little bit more about LPG tankers or LPG market, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, of course. And it's a good question. And, and I, I tried to discuss some of it. I'm, I'm imagining you've already kind of seen what we've uh, recorded and we've done live here. Uh, there's not a lot more to add in terms of the broad fundamental story. Uh, this is a strong market. We, we have strong demand growth in India and China. We have strong export growth of the United States. There's a solid arbitrage between the lower cost U.S. exports, and the higher cost uh, LPG imports in Asia and India. Uh, so that's a strong market. And then you add on to that, that the order book has been sort of pushed out and delayed a little bit. So there wasn't as much supply as folks, including myself, had expected. And then finally, you sprinkle in the Panama Canal disruptions. And, and so I, I think that's really um, the, the story in a nutshell of what's going on there. Now I must, to be transparent and, and disclose things, uh, I currently have a small, it, it's via some puts, but I have a small short position actually in Dorian LPG, the stock symbol LPG. Uh, I, I think the stock is, I think it's a great company. I love the management. I, I like the fundamental story. I, I think the stock's gotten a little bit overheated. I, I wouldn't BS anyone or, or nothing like that. I want to be clear about my positioning. Um, so I, I am not a fan of those stocks. I see absolutely no reason why I would ever invest in an LPG stock when I could invest in a tanker stock. I just, I just don't. And I'm just being transparent and clear about that. Uh, but, the, but the fundamental story is solid. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, when you look at LPG LNG tankers too, they're, the, you know, in terms of even construction, if you start building them today, a, a, a tanker is going to come out quicker than an LPG LNG. There's very few. It's Korea and, and China that's building them right now. Uh, there's a long lead time. It's getting longer to build ships. It's more expensive to build ship. The ship costs are going up. One of the things we've seen since 2009 is consolidation in the shipyards. We're down about 40% of where we were back then. This, uh, the cost is going up. The time to build is going up, even in places like China, Korea, and Japan. So, you know, even when you start looking at those long-term replacements, you know, everyone was thinking when the, the, the gas got cut off from Europe to, uh, to from Russia, that was going to cause a lot of issues. And, and what we saw was a pretty benign winter last year. And so we had a lot. We saw some crazy LNG rates there for a while, $100,000 a day. Uh, it, it was insane. And then what we saw was 30 LNG tankers sitting off Europe waiting to offload because there wasn't the shore side. It, it wasn't so much the storage facilities. It was the processing to go from liquefied natural gas to natural gas. But now Europe has fixed that a lot. We're seeing a lot more of those stations being built so that they can do that. So I, I think it's it, you got to be a little careful 
in that sector. The other question I, I saw was this one. I thought it was a really interesting one. How to handle the case when a peace deal in Ukraine happens and, and the tankers suddenly crash. I, I, I don't want to talk about the crash as much. But but I think you know being yeah. aware of of when the geopolitical changes is is yeah. important. It's really important to be watching what happens. Yeah. And and I, I I don't think you're going to see a crash per se because I think one of the things that you've talked about extensively is how that tanker market doesn't have a lot of play in it to begin with. So that even if you invest, I think what you would probably and, and again you could disagree with me if, if on this and and please let me know what you think. You know, I, I think all of a sudden you start seeing those old tankers go, and, and then the market becomes even more dicey going forward. I, 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 I don't know what you think on that one. No, I, I, I'm glad the question was asked, and it's a good it's a good question. I, I certainly don't uh, mean anything against the question, but I'm so glad it was asked because I think it is just totally emblematic of this absolutely like false in my opinion, bogus narrative out there. Um, and, and keep in mind, like I just finished my, my dissertation on this very topic of tanker market disruption and rerouting of cargoes. And so by my best estimate, and there's other folks who've done independent analysis as well, we have stuff from Clarkson's and Lloyd's List and other sources, the amount of rerouting and, and ton mile impact caused by the sanctions was around 6%. So it's about a 6% net change overall at this point. Now, now, in the first couple of months, yeah, there's all sorts of crazy stuff happening. Uh, Europeans were panicking for distillates. There's a lot of front running of sanctions. That's all settled. And that's all happened. That's all done. So the current impact from sanctions is roughly about 6% to ton miles. But look how many vessels are over 20 years old that have no, absolutely no place in a legitimate commercial trading fleet. Look how many vessels are turning 15 plus and they're going to be impacted by EEXI, CII, the European trading uh, regimes. And, and these are ships that right now have no part in any of those regimes because of their status in the dark fleet. And I think if you look at the amount of ships that are in the dark fleet, the amount of ships that have no place in a valid commercial trading fleet, it's much, much higher than five to six percent. And, and so if, if there's peace, I, I think we have to be careful when we're talking about trades and investments and what we're wishing for and hoping for and all that stuff. Um, I, I hope there is a reasonable conclusion uh, to this, this crisis in Ukraine. And I don't even see that as being a valid. I mean, it, when I look at the trade off between the sanctions and the dark fleet and the amount of ships, um, I, I don't want to go out of my way and say like that would necessarily be super bullish, right, on shipping. But I, but I think most likely it's a wash. And I think if you give it six or seven or eight months for the ships to start to re-enter broad global trade, then then I think it's probably net bullish if, if that happened. And, and this is all predicated on this fact that like suddenly. Not only is there going to be peace in Ukraine tomorrow, which we should all hope for, but not only that, but then all of a sudden the entire European plus US regime is going to just give up sanctions tomorrow. And the fact that sanctions are going to be completely dropped if Russia doesn't relinquish any territory or doesn't, doesn't pull back and, and give concessions and reparations to Ukraine and pay for the massive damage that's been done there. Um, again, I try to stay in my lane. But I, I think it's predicated on a lot of assumptions. And I, but I, but I, but I, but I'm glad the question was asked because I get that question almost every day. And I've probably gotten yeah. that question 20 or 30 times in the last couple of months. And, and it, it's sort of this, it's sort of this notion that first of all, uh, there's a there's a ceasefire right on the right around the corner. Second of all, sanctions are going to just drop. And third of all, I think it's sort of a misunderstanding of the balance of the dark trade and the dark trade and the age of the ships. Yeah, I, I also think too it, it goes to demonstrate how volatile shipping has become. I, I think you know the you know the norm. You know, again, I got Bruce Jones on on Thursday who wrote to rule the waves, and he talks about how superpowers you know use the world's oceans. And I think we we are seeing number one, shipping companies playing a much more important role in in driving uh, uh, economic not just economic factors but political and and military factors. Uh, you saw, you know, like you said, it was it was Maris that set, all of a sudden pulled out, and the other shipping lines followed it. It was the same way with Maris pulling out of Russia when Russia invaded Ukraine, and and I think as we get into a much more volatile global situation, then the market will also be volatile in some cases, uh, and 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 we see what happens with the Houthi, who you know, but by like you said, nobody had Houthi on their on on their bingo card for 2023 that they would interdict 15 percent of the world trade or at least affect 15% of the world trade. And, and, and again, this is a non-state actor hurling missiles and really they haven't hit that many ships. And, and yet 
all of a sudden it's created this massive disruption. And, and so I think that's the big uh, uh, volatile thing going on. Uh, Jay, I'm going to bring up your, your site one more time and, and let you have your kind of uh, closing here. Uh, I, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's been an hour. I don't want to keep your time because I know you're working on on, on, a, on a different shift than me. So uh, for, for Jay, this is the middle of the night. Uh, so we're going to try to get Jay uh, uh, off here in a second. Uh, I want to appreciate you coming on. And again, uh, I want to in invite everybody to go check out uh, Jay's site. I have the, uh, I've had the, the link here in the show notes for you. I'll have it posted uh, with the video here so you can go to it afterwards. Check it out. So if you're checking this video out later on, you're not watching it live, you'll be able to see it and link right over to it. Uh, Jay, any last closing before we uh, sign off for this year and, and and look forward to hopefully a better 2024? But I've been saying this since 2020 and it hasn't seemed to be getting better yet. Well, I mean, Sal, if you would have asked me one of my top predictions a year ago, uh, we are long only models on value investors edge, which are just stocks, not options, nothing crazy, literally just, just an average of stocks that we pick. Um, they went up 55% in 2022, Sal. And if you would have asked me at the end of last year, what is one of my surefire predictions for 2023? I would have said, we're going to do less than that. I mean, I would just be thrilled. I would be blown away if we did even 30% in 2023. And as of uh, this morning, the long only model portfolios were at 57% in 2023. Um, so I can just, you know, hope that, you know, as we enter 2024 for half as good of performance, uh, next year, uh, but seriously for, for folks who are interested in what we do, uh, we are boutique research platform, uh, funded by investors, by the family offices and hedge funds that work with us and pay for our research. Uh, we have yearly plans and monthly plans available and, you know, folks, if folks don't like our research, they don't sign up for, it, they don't pay for it. So we have to deliver the results. We have to be ahead of the curve. We have to be ahead of these things. I'm not always right. Um, I make mistakes uh, all the time, uh, but in shipping and in these sorts of markets, if you're right 50, 60% of the time, uh, there can be some enormous returns. And, and Sal, it's always great talking with you. It's always great chopping it up. And, and I look forward to uh, continuing this dialogue and, and back and forth into 2024. And if tankers don't do well in 2024, Sal, um, I expect you and everybody else is listening today and listening <laughs> to the recording, hold my feet to the fire, drag me around and say how wrong I was. I, I've, I've been wrong before. Um, but I am very bullish uh, tankers. And I want to make that very clear. Hey, I, and I will have the link in the show notes here for the past talks I've had with Jay. You can go ahead and take a look at where we've been in the past talking about it. Jay, it's been great to have you on. I enjoy every time we get a chance to have a conversation. Uh, I, I am jealous about the Harvard plaque in the background with the flag, you know, being a, a doctor from Harvard and everything. But my doctor is from Alabama, so we may be national championships and champions here in, 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 in a few in, in a week or two. So uh, I know you were cheering on Air Force the other day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay, what an end of the season. We we can't compete it, it, with Alabama though. So I'll give, I'll give you that. It, one. It, it. It will, it will be the end. If, if Alabama wins, that'll be the end all to drive everyone's head to explode when it comes to the national football championship. Jay, I want to thank you again. Uh, just for everybody who's watching uh, Thursday at noon Eastern time, we're going to have Bruce Jones on to talk about the geopolitics side uh, to rule the ways. And then on Friday, hang on, hang on tight. John Conrad's coming on. I don't know where we're going with that, but we're going to be talking about news for the end of the year. Uh, and and recapping everything. So Jay, I appreciate it again. It was great talking to you and look forward to talking to you throughout the year. See you, Sal. Bye.